If you please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 will begin by reading verses 1 through verse 13 where Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says to stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a, doc, a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none other wise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear the judgment, whosoever he be. Now, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. For, brethren, ye have been called to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. <clears throat> this morning's sermon is entitled, Liberty to Serve. Paul begins here by stating that we should stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. This liberty is obviously a reference to salvation. It is a reference to being freed from the past. Being freed from past sin, wherein he says, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, but also from the yoke of the old law, as he mentions from verses 2 through the passage that we have just read. The church at Galatia was dealing with at least one individual or more who was troubling the church with the notion that circumcision was once again bound by law. And uh, Paul was sent to correct this matter. And his response was, if it is the case that circumcision still avails, then I suffer persecution for naught because I teach that the old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2 verse 14. And I am persecuted by those on the Judaistic side who condemn me for teaching that. And then he says, in verse 3, I testify to every man who is circumcised that he is debtor to do the whole law, not just one aspect of the law. That if you're going to obey the law of Moses, in order to be obedient to the law of Moses, one had to obey every law, 613 of them, and not just one or two that he picked out and chose. The same is true under the law of Christ, the New Testament system of faith. But what Paul was saying was the liberty that we have is a liberty from past sin, for we have had our past sins washed away, Revelation 1, verse 5, Acts 22, verse 16, and liberty from the, the bounds of the old law. We have been made free from that old law. That no one was debtor to do any of the whole law because the whole law had been nailed to the cross. Jesus having perfectly fulfilled it, that being part of the statement Jesus made on the cross, it is finished. His work here on earth was finished. The plan to save man had come to fruition by Him dying on the cross. His work up until that point was done. And the, and the law had been fulfilled by Jesus, the sinlessly perfect Son of God. 
And so here, the church at Galatia is being told to ignore the troubler or troublers who had caused them not to obey the truth. Verse 7. He said, you did run well as Christians, but now someone has taught you something or has troubled you to the point that you no longer obey the truth. You can't be free if you're not obeying the truth. So they were being entangled again back into something that separated them from the law of Christ. Whether that be sin, as we know, uh, sins of commission or sins of omission, or going back to the old law. He says, verse 4, you have fallen from grace. I had an interesting discussion with an individual about this statement, you have fallen from grace. And the individual took the position that just because God said you have fallen from grace doesn't mean you can fall from grace. Because of the context. And I said, no matter what the context is, whatever they did that caused them to fall from grace. <laughs> That's what God said. Now the context tells us what it was. They were obeying the law. They were trying to obey a part of the law of Moses. But that's not it. To obey part of the law of Moses was to leave Christ. You can't obey some other law and be faithful to the law of Christ. You can't say that you're obedient to some other man and still be faithful to God. That's why he said you do or you did run well, verse 7, but you're not now obeying the truth. They had stopped obeying the truth when they started obeying something else. Why well, someone might say, well, they were faithful to the truth. They just added circumcision. Well, you add circumcision, Galatians 1 tells us, you made the truth of no effect. You're preaching another gospel. Once you add to the gospel, you've made it another gospel. If you subtract from the gospel, you've made it another gospel. You've made it not Christ's. That's why he says in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Why? Yes, they may have been doing the law of Christ, but they were also adding to the law of Christ. They were making it their, their own law. To add to the law of Christ was to make it their own law. Christ was no effect to them. They had indeed fallen from grace. And whether that falling from grace was to sin against the law of Christ, which they had done by adding to it and separating themselves to another gospel, which Paul obviously said in Galatians 1, 6-9, never to go to, they had made Christ of no effect in their lives. So they had taken this liberty, this freedom for granted, and they had fallen from that liberty. Paul tells them to stand fast in the liberty where Christ had made them free. If it was Christ who had made them free, why would they do anything other than what Jesus said? If Jesus in His teaching taught nothing of circumcision, then why would you add to Christ's law and think that you are doing something that would bring you freedom? And of course, the answer was well noted. They had fallen from that liberty wherewith they had made, been made free. To those who troubled the church, Paul said, I'd like for them to be dealt with. If I find out who they are, I'm sure Paul would have dealt with them. But if they're not dealt with in this life, they'll be dealt with in the next. Nonetheless, you continue to remember from where you came. You continue to remember the call that you received by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 14, to be freed from your past sins, to be added to the church of Christ, and to be freed from 
the law of Moses. The freedom of salvation finds itself manifested in different ways. In John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said to the Jews who believed, If you continue in My Word, then are you My disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The church that Paul was speaking to had been made free, but they were no longer in continuing in the Word, were they? They were being entangled again into a law that no longer existed. In verse 36, drop down to verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Free indeed. <laughs> There's no need for anything else, is there? There was no need to go back to the old law to pick out something that would help you. There was, you were free indeed. It was uh, full freedom. And there was no uh, nothing wanting. There was nothing missing in that liberty. They found freedom from the guilt of sin. They knew that they had transgressed. That's the very definition of sin but they knew that one who was sinless had taken their place. The wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ our Lord Jesus. John, or Romans 6, verse 23. That guilt and that penalty had been taken away for those who had obeyed the Gospel and been added to the Lord's church. They recognized, Romans 6, verse 6, that the old man had been crucified with Christ that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. They knew that they were considered to be children of God. Galatians 3, 26 through verse 29. Adopted. Romans 8, verse 15. Members of the household of faith, according to Timothy. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, they knew therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That was a liberty that they should have been glorying in. A liberty that they should have been able to stand fast and stand firm in. But as Paul said in Galatians 5, verse 8, this persuasion comes not of Him who called you. It came from outside the body of Christ, didn't it? It didn't come from inspiration. It didn't come from God. It came from man. It should have been rejected. And Paul said not only should it be rejected, it should be rejected openly. Verse 9, because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Then in Galatians chapter 5, after pointing out or reminding the church of this liberty that existed only in Christ, only in the body of Christ, only in His church, only among those who had obeyed the gospel of Christ, they were told to deny any law that separated them from the law of Christ, that being the law of Moses, and to deny themselves of worldly lust. To deny themselves of the flesh in regards to the law that had many deeds that were fleshly. And look to the liberty that belonged in the spiritual realm under the law of Christ. In verse 13 he says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love 
serve one another. Here, the freedom that we have was not to be taken for granted. The freedom that we have been given was not to be used as a crutch or an excuse. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul asks this rhetorical question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Put it in the context of Galatians 5. What should we do with this liberty? Should we continue to sin that this liberty, that because we have freedom, we can do whatever we want? You know, a lot of people today believe that's what their freedom allows them to do. They believe that once they're saved, they're always saved, and it doesn't matter what they do from that point on. They can sin. They can act in any way that they want to. And, uh, and they cannot lose their soul. They're free to do whatever they please. There are people who teach the truth on that matter, but act like they don't, do they? <laughs> they teach the truth that one can so sin as to lose his salvation, but then they act like their freedom allows them to do whatever they please. Worship God when they want to. Worship God if they, if they want to. Choose not to worship God. They don't stand fast in the liberty wherewith they have been called. And Paul answers this in Romans 6, verse 2, God forbid. <laughs> Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Should we do whatever we want to because we're free? No, God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin live in sin? You can't be dead to sin and live in sin at the same time. <laughs> you can't be dead to the world and live in the world at the same time. You can't be crucified with Christ and live like one of the thieves. Stand fast therefore in the liberty where we Christ hath made us free, but only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Now these individuals were using the liberty to an occasion to the flesh, weren't they? The flesh in this regard was the law of Moses. The law of circumcision. But it could have been any other law representative of the 613. Any addition to the New Testament law system and any uh, subtraction would have made it a, a, a godless, ungodly law. One that would not free from sin. One that would not free from the guilt or punishment of sin. One that would not free from the power of sin. One that would entangle a person and sin again. So what then does Paul say we ought to use this liberty for? Not as an occasion to do what we want. Not as an occasion to do what we please. Not as an occasion to believe what we want. Not as an occasion to practice what we want. But notice what he says. But by love, serve one another. <laughs> See, we're free to serve. That seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? But isn't that the life Jesus lived? That's the life Jesus lived, isn't it? He was free. But He came here to serve, didn't He? In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, beginning of verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Do you want to be Christ-minded? People say, I want, to, I want to be like Christ. I want to be Christ-minded. And then they don't read Philippians chapter 2. <laughs> they don't open up their Bible to see what Jesus thought. You can't be Christ-minded if you don't know what Jesus thinks. Here's the mind that you ought to have. Verse 6, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't robbery because He was equal with God. He is equal with God. God the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit equal in deity. But notice verse 7, He voluntarily made Himself of no reputation and took upon Himself the form of a what? 
a servant. He was free. And what did he do with that freedom? He used it to do good. He humbled himself to serve. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. You know in Revelation 2 verse 10, the Bible says be faithful unto death. And the idea there is be faithful even to, if it means your life, even to the point of being killed for it. And you will receive a crown of life. You know, God's never asked us to do something He Himself didn't do. Jesus did that, didn't He? He didn't have to. He's God. He voluntarily humbled Himself and became obedient to the faith and gave Himself to die. Being free he, he certainly did not use his liberty as an occasion for the flesh, did he? Verse 9, the result. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. The Bible tells us in many places, the book of James other areas. Let us be the humblers. Let us do the humbling. And let God do the exalting. A lot of people want to be exalted in this life. Sit in the foremost seats. Have people talk about them. And have their names and lights, so to speak. But Jesus took upon Himself no reputation took upon Himself the form of a servant, though He was a king, right? And not only was He a king, He was king of kings, Lord of lords, but took upon Himself the form of a servant. You know, our uh, elected officials today ought to think about that. That the king of all kings, the, the highest leader of all leaders, took upon Himself the form of a servant. When you find a leader with a servant's heart, you found a pretty good leader. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 17, Paul says, God be thanked that you were the servants of sin but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You see, you were the servants of sin. Then you were freed from sin, not to do as you please, but to what? <coughs> to serve God. A servant of righteousness is to serve what is right. And God defines right throughout the New Testament. Verse 20, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. <laughs> now that's how people look at it, isn't it? Well, you think about that. I'm, I was freed from freedom. That's what being lost is. It's a double negative, right? When you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. That is, you could do whatever you pleased. Or you could do nothing. Right? Because to serve sin is to serve self, is to please self, is to do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about what God says in order to serve sin, in other words. But then that, the question is asked, what fruit had you then in those things wherever you were, are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So which is better? It's obvious, isn't it? The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Romans 6 verse 23. Do you choose to be free from righteousness? Righteousness. 
to do as you please or free from sin to know that you'll be with God in eternity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul dealt with this idea of circumcision in the church of Corinth as well. First Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> and we'll start in verse 21. Paul says, Art thou being called, art thou called to be a servant? Well, yes, that was right. <laughs> that was the question. It was a rhetorical question. Have you been called to serve? And of course the answer was yes, we've been called to serve. Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it. Use the freedom you have to do what's right. Use the freedom you have to do good for the Lord. For he that is called in the Lord is a servant. Being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. You're bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherewith he is called therein abide with God. To abide with God is to abide in His Word. You remember in uh, speaking of the vine and the branches, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me hath life. To abide in Christ is to abide in His Word, to abide in His doctrine. To abide in His doctrine is to know what's right. To know what right is and to abide in what right is is to do what is right. Salvation does not free us from responsibility. Salvation frees us to be responsible. <laughs> Salvation frees us to do the Lord's bidding. It does not make us free to sin. Romans 6, verse 17. God be thanked that, you, that uh, though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which you were delivered. Having been made free from sin, you became the servants or slaves of righteousness. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Christianity is not a self pleasing religion is it it's a personal responsibility but personal responsibility demands that we do good for others then in verse 13 Paul gives us the motive for this service and the motive should be very simple right the motive for God sending his son right the motive for Jesus humbling Himself to be in the form of man and dying on the cross. Are those not the same motives that should lead us who are freed now because of that to serve one another? That's what He says, isn't it? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. That's the motivation, isn't it? That's the motivation that sent that God sent His Son for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. It's the motivation for Jesus to die for the sins of the world because He loved us. It is that motivation then that should leave us or lead us to do what's right, to do what's good to do what's good in, in service to the King. And that is to serve one another. And this is love, John said, not that we love God, nor that He loved us, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so love us, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 10 and 11. In 1 John 5, 2 and 3. 
That motivation of love leads us to obedience. By this we know that we love God. When we love the children of God, when we love God and keep His commandments, for this is the love of God that we keep His commands and His commandments are not burdened. Jesus said in John 14 verse 15, If you love Me, keep My commandments. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, Paul says, The love of Christ constraineth us, or compels us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. Jesus didn't die for our sins because we were alive, did He? He didn't die for our sins because just to give us a backup plan, right? No, we needed it. We were dead. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8 and 9. So the motivation to serve one another is love. And it's the motivation that's, that, you, that sent Jesus to this earth. It's the motivation that sent Jesus to the cross. It's the motivation of us to love one another, to serve one another in response to His love to us. Now, how do, we look, how do we serve one another? How do we serve one another? We serve one another by serving like Christ did, don't we? When Jesus told His disciples to go into all the world and teach the Gospel to every creature, that's serving one another. To share the gospel, to preach the gospel to the whole world. That's loving one another. That's sharing the gospel with one another. That's sharing this freedom. We're free to share our freedom. <laughs> right? We've been free to serve. We've been free to, to respond. We've been free to share our freedom. We should want as many, po uh, many as possible to heed that call to be freed from their past sins, from laws that don't save, to be freed to serve others. To be freed to serve in the kingdom of God. Our love motivates us to teach the world as we have been taught. In chapter 6 of Galatians, chapter of Galatians, Paul gives us some other reasons or other ways to serve Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. When an individual who is fallen from grace, the Bible says that those who are more mature, stronger in the faith, are to serve, to come to the rescue to aid that individual who needs spiritual nourishment, who needs spiritual encouragement, who is on a slippery path to apostasy that they don't fall away. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which who are spiritually mature, restore that one. So in service, we teach the truth, bringing about freedom. Then we help those who are free remain free. And we hope that our brethren look to us and help keep us free. In verse 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When we see a brother in need, we help. In the context, obviously, it's talking about spiritual needs and that's the most important need. But I would contend that if an honest and humble heart 
received physical help from his brothers and sisters in Christ, he would see that as spiritual help too. <laughs> you know, when you look and you say, these people really do love me like a brother. They treat me like a brother. They treat me like family. That should be spiritual encouragement. It's our desire to spread that spiritual encouragement. But I, as the receiver or the recipient, should have the humble, humo the humble, honest heart to recognize that spiritual encouragement. And so we have been given liberty to serve. Liberty in Christ. Liberty to do the bidding of Christ. Liberty to preach the gospel of Christ. Liberty to serve under His kingship. Liberty to help others who are doing the same. And liberty to share and spread that freedom to others. Liberty to serve. It's a selfless response to a selfless <coughs> gift. For God gave His only begotten Son. And Jesus gave Himself. And the least we can do is stop robbing ourselves of the joy of being free in Christ and start being selfless. Heed the call to be right with God, to serve God, and to serve one another. Freedom comes by hearing the gospel and obeying it. Confessing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, admitting error in our life, pointing out that that error can separate us from God, confessing that Jesus is the Christ, being immersed in water to have our past sins washed away. The Lord adds those individuals to His church, Acts 2 verse 47. They are freed from their past. They are freed from their past sin. They are freed from old laws. They are freed to serve. They are freed to do what's right. They are freed to be servants of God. Once we have obeyed the Gospel, it is our responsibility to continue to be faithful to God and to help one another remain faithful to God. If anyone here has not obeyed the Gospel, the invitation is open. If you've already obeyed those initial acts, but something has gone astray, then take care of that privately if it's of a private nature. If it's of a public nature, we'll assist you in any way that you would like for us to do as we stand and sing. Someday you'll stand and